hello everyone and thank you for listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast where we discuss careers, science and research. I'm Dr. Stefania Forner and I'm delighted to be the guest hosting this week's show. I work at the Alzheimer Association as Director of Medical and Scientific Relations and my main role is overseeing and managing the day-to-day -day function of the International Research Grants Program and the Strategic Grants Funding Program. Today, me and my amazing panel of guests are going to share some of top tips and advice on how to be a successful applicant for the, a fellowship from the Alzheimer's Association or even a research grants for the Alzheimer's Association. As the largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research, the Alzheimer's Association is committed to accelerating the global progress of new treatments, prevention, and ultimately a cure. There's nothing we like more than funding great people and research, and it makes the reviewer's job and my job a lot easier when we get great applications. So this show is all about making my life easier and getting you the funding you need. So let's go. Uh, let's start going around and introducing our, our guests. We have today the unstoppable Dr. Deanna Bird assistant professor at Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation in Arizona, United States. Next, we have the legendary Dr. Eduardo Zimmer, assistant professor at Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And finally, I'm delighted to welcome the incredible Dr. Joe Sandra, associate professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine. So hello, everyone. Thanks for talking to me and joining us today. So I would like, Diana, just if you want to introduce yourself a little bit and talk about yourself a little bit, and then we'll go to uh, Eduardo and Joe. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to be on this podcast today and um, really just share some insights with you guys as you're thinking about applying to the Alzheimer's Association which is an amazing funding opportunity. So definitely do it. Um, I study everything that has to do with um, cognitive and mental health outcomes in black Americans. In particular, I study three areas. I study um, chronic stressors. Um, I also study uh, biological stressors and coping factors, as well as chronic health conditions and how these things work together or against um, developing um, cognitive decline or um, Alzheimer's and dementia later life in Black Americans. Eduardo. Hi, Stefania. Thank you very much for, for having me here. It's a great pleasure. And so I'm Eduardo. I'm assistant professor in, in Brazil. So just to start, I would like to remind you that Alzheimer's Association funds research in Brazil, funds research in international research everywhere around the globe. And I have a big lab here. We have around 30 students and the lab is interested in understanding neurodegeneration, astrocytes and biomarkers in, in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And I'm look, looking forward to discuss with you today. Sounds awesome. Joe. My name is Joe Abisambra. As, uh, as Stefania mentioned, I'm an associate professor at the University of Florida. And I also play a role in the Dean's office as assistant Dean of diversity and health equity. Um, and on the research side, uh, my main job and passion is to essentially understand how the brain works. And um, I'm focusing on um, one way to learn about how the brain works is to study diseases in which the brain doesn't um, function as well as it should. And so I've been focusing most of my work on a protein called tau. And that's given me an amazing opportunity to study um, more than 20 neurodegenerative diseases that share features with Alzheimer's disease. And one of the ones that we also look at besides Alzheimer's is uh, the long-term consequences of repetitive head injuries, also known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Sounds good, thank you all. And I wanna point it out that all of these great panelists, they actually participated on the masterclass webinar series that we had for iStar on the Alzheimer's Association where they shared their tips and success. So today we're going to go and kind of do a take home message, a summary of that webinar series. On that note as well, if you're not part of iStart yet, uh, I would encourage you to consider being part of it and visit the uh, 
uh, slash I start. So thank you all for participating today. We we try to make this topic of grant writing, uh, fellowship writing a little bit easier and break down into stages. We're going to break down to stages of the Alzheimer Association Research Fellowship, but all of you, uh, well, Joe, Eduardo, and Diana are also reviewers, so they will also give their perspective as reviewers, as mentors of the applicants. So let's start with you, Diana. When you're putting out a letter of intent, uh, when, uh, or thinking about your own research or a student of yours putting something um, in the future, of thinking about planning to submit something, what is your process? Do you plan ahead? Um, how, how is your train of thought? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for myself and for my students, um, I definitely plan ahead. So I think it definitely takes time to allow your ideas to incubate and um, you don't want to be rushed at the last minute. So, um, you know, being very thoughtful around the timeline when things are due, because without the letter of intent, um, the application cannot move forward. So it's really important that Although the letter of intent is um, not a lengthy document, um, it's worthy for you to spend your time um, to one, plan ahead that you can maybe have multiple iterations of it. It's also a great strategy to share that material with um, say some other senior colleagues or um, you know faculty or anyone else that your mentors that you have that you're thinking about working with on the um, proposal. Uh, it would be great to get their feedback at that stage. So really the planning ahead is important, um, even when it comes to the letter of intent, which is maybe a shorter document compared to the overall application. Eduardo, what's your train of, of thought? Do you, do you do anything different? How does it work? We're in different, you're in a different country, so do you have maybe more bureaucracy on your end to put a letter of intent or no? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, you, with everything. You know, plan ahead is critical. And for Brazilians like me, like we have a lot of bureaucracy in the university here. So if you, if you do not plan ahead, you will not be able to, to, uh, to submit your, your letter of intent. And the other thing that I strongly agree is the idea of sharing the letter of intent with your colleagues, with your senior mentors, with your students. So it's better to receive critiques from people that you know than to receive critiques from people that you don't know. That would be the reviewers, right? So it's better to share always before, before submitting. And uh, the other thing that uh, I think it's super important. So you have one page to deliver your novelty, to deliver your idea, your objectives. So you need to be very clear. So the flow needs to be, you know, it needs to, to, to understand what the proposal uh, will be based on the letter of intent. So it's only one page and usually it takes a lot of time to have a good one page with you know with a good flow with like the, the objectives with the aims very very clear so this is this is my advice what about you joe well uh my process is uh like like many of us ongoing constantly and so since uh the early stages of my career i always tried to have two projects two big ideas and somehow they converged uh, in the main field that I was interested in and passionate about. And so I tried over time to package it. And, and the beauty of it is that it's not starting today. It's that it's always running in the back of my head. And, and I think about it. And when I'm walking my dog, I think about it. And when all of a sudden, at one point, I was mowing the lawn, I was thinking, and you never know when that idea is going to hit. And so packaging that for each one of the applications for each one of the granting, uh, the grant agencies and so on, allowed me to format these ideas in a concise, brief way that could translate a vision and a strategy. And that's exactly what the letter of intent can help delineate. I found the letter of intent to be very helpful actually, because it, it, it made me be very concise and organized in a tangible way how I was gonna plan those ideas. So I do wanna have a question, um... I'll start with you, Deanna, and then go around as well. But when you're planning for a letter of intent, 
uh, do you already have like the whole full application if you're invited for a full application set in your hand or do you do like a the letter of intent as a quoting like a pilot study like i'm just gonna put this in a paper and if i get called for a full application i'm gonna think about my aims more through like throughout uh, more clear or do you already have the vision from the beginning to end when you put the letter of intent that's a great question i would like to say that i have the vision from the beginning to the end um but <laughs> you know the best made plans are meant to be changed as they say um so i would say in a perfect world uh, my suggestion would be yes if you could have sort of like this letter of intent and then you know uh, your aims already drafted of what you're thinking about for the full proposal or the full application if you're invited to do so um, that's just wonderful right i mean it really streamlines the process because one when you go in to then um, work on the full application um, it's easier right let's just logistically it's more it's, it's easier to approach it when you already have um you know some formative um, ideas around what you're going to do, how you're going to approach it, you have the data, right? So a lot of those details are sort of already worked out in your mind and that therefore makes the application components themselves potentially easier. Um, in reality though, I think that um, it, you know, we don't always work that way. So don't, don't fret. If you don't have it, I still would strongly suggest that you apply with putting in your letter of intent and um, maybe after the letter of intent goes in, begin to think about, you know, if this is um, invited for a full application, what would I, how would I develop this further? So, you know, really being critical about, okay, you know, what data set am I going to use? What's going to be, you know, my measures? Um, who would I want to be as my mentors? Or who would I even want to write me letters of support, right? So even beginning to pull together some of the pieces post the letter of intent will be helpful for you. The final thing I think that I will say that's really, really helpful for me was that, um, you know, it's like it's sort of like they say this idea, it's great to kind of pitch your idea to different funding agencies. So, um, you know, another thing to think about is, uh, you know, if you don't have a complete vision for, for this, but you're sort of seeing how the Alzheimer's work can really fit along with this funding. So maybe you have another idea so that you've already kind of got aims and things like that. It may be that you could just tweak some of something that you have by changing your focus slightly, right? So we all have typically different projects that we're working on at any given time. So don't necessarily think that you have to come up with something completely from scratch. It may be that, for example, you had a proposal that you put out on say physical health, and now you're like, wow, I never thought about it. Maybe I can just incorporate um, some Alzheimer's measures in this, or I can some cognitive measures and I can maybe use the same population, right? So it allows you to stay in the same vein as your research interests and not deviate too much and um, also kind of help you to sort of have this sort of like well put together application once you're invited. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, especially for uh, early career uh, researchers, sometimes you don't, you can use different mechanisms. Obviously from the Alzheimer's Association perspective, I want to let the viewers, uh, the listeners know that actually we won't uh, fund overlapping studies. So if you are uh, doing the same study elsewhere, uh, being funded elsewhere, we won't fund it. But I do agree with Deanna on using that like data set. You can use the data set and create a different study or a different idea. And also a reminder to all the listeners, if you are planning to apply for the Alzheimer's Association, we don't require preliminary data. It is not a requirement. Obviously, if you have and it makes the the hypothesis stronger and it, you can prove that your hypothesis, you are highly, it's highly recommended that you present preliminary data on your applications for a full application, but it is not recommended. So if it is something more pilot, uh, go for it. Eduardo, what, do you have anything, do you plan like, Obviously, I agree with Diana, like we all wish in the perfect world that we had the idea from the beginning to end all set up in the brain, but um, it doesn't happen always like that. So what's your process? Yeah, I think that the, Diana and you covered almost everything here. So, but if you have the vision, 
So the aims, of course, you can expand, expand later. So you have the, the letter of intent, and when you start to write the full project to include, if you have preliminary data, uh, sometimes you, you, you see that, oh my God, I can include a new experiment here. I can add this database. So uh, this, I think this is, is something that happens a lot. You write the letter of intent, you have one idea. When you start to write the full project, you realize that, you know, there are, there are a few experiments that you should include. There are a sub aim that you also need to include. So I don't think this is a problem. But if you have your main vision, you know, the primary out the outcome, something that you are really interested in, I think that you can expand, expand in the, in the, in the full submission. But, but I think that like the, the main question the la of the letter of intent should be the, the question that you are answering in the full project. Great, Joel, so when you're mowing your lawn on the Saturday morning, thinking about the project, do you think that the whole thing, is, do you do it as Eduardo mentioned, uh, when you're writing the full application, then you're like, you have that great idea. No, 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 no. So I, I have a block. I have two blocks, right? And, and I, I just start sculpting away, sculpting away and coming up with something. Now the ideas come up during, you know, mowing the lawn or, or changing my baby's diaper or whatever, but whatever's happening there, it's, it just, whatever clicks, the idea is there. And with that, we can build out to, to the actual proposal. But of course you're sculpting, right? And, and to build up on something that you said, wouldn't it be amazing to have so many grants funded that you say, you know, I have to turn these one or two down because they overlap. So here's the big advantage of that, of submitting to different um, uh, funding agencies. And it's that you will always get feedback. And the feedback that you get anonymously can help you sculpt your own grant. It certainly helped me in, get, in refining my ideas and further feeding them into, into a, 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 a package that could be funded, whether it was for the National Institutes of Health, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, and, and other funding agencies. Um, and, and the scope is also important. For example, the early investigator grants from the Alzheimer's Association are uh, similar in scope to maybe a little bit uh, around the range of an R21 for a year or two, um, which is one of the um, uh, investigator-initiated grants from the National Institutes of Health. And so you, what I've done is taken a similar um, grant that I submitted to the Alzheimer's Association, also to the National Institutes of Health. And it hasn't happened yet, but if I got both, then I could turn one of them down. But, uh, but what's important is that I always get the feedback and, and it's a work in progress. I never have the idea all at once. It's a work in progress. That's, yeah, that's great advice. So I think for summary of this first conversation that we ha we're having, it's like plan, right? Think about it, share with your collaborators. And as um, mentors, because we're talking also as your, as applicants, but as mentors, so for the Alzheimer's Association Research Fellowship, you have the mentorship component. You also have the applicant component. And then you, so you have the mentorship then um, portion that the mentor will say, what the training plan is, how it's going to support the applicant. You have the applicant write an app, the statement of commitment of how that's going to advance its own career, professional development, how it's going to match with the mentor training plan. So when you were oh, applying, Diana, like you were, a, you were a fellow, how did you work with your mentor? But also if you are reviewing an application uh, for the same association, how do you evaluate between the mentor and the applicant commitment? How do you do that? So I guess to answer your first question, um, you know, as the applicant, I definitely worked with my mentors. I found that, you know, it not only strengthened my application, it improved um, sort of what we had designed in terms of what we're proposing we're going to be doing. Um, so the mentoring plan that I'm going to be um, putting forth in my application. Um, and then I would say uh, one of the ways that as a, if I was reviewing that I would do that is I would look at one, the letters. Um, to make sure that the the letters from the mentors are really in support of the applicant, that the applicant has the potential to not only do the work, 
but um, has the potential to really be a leader in the field of, of, of Alzheimer's research, right? I mean, that's really the emphasis. Um, so can I see um, their potential and their future potential? This is really important. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, in looking at the mentoring plan, um, how is it that the applicant is going to be um, using their mentor in terms of their development and their career development? And then also, um, how is that researcher going to be developing um, independently? So, uh, you know, not only is the mentor going to be introducing um, the applicant to, uh, say, their networks, and to um, collaborative, collaborative opportunities. But then beyond that, what is the applicant saying that they're gonna do to further sort of develop their own professional networks and develop their own, um, um, really their own career trajectory. So that's sort of some of the things that I would look for um, as a reviewer. Fantastic. Eduardo, anything to add as a- Yes, okay. yes. So I, I, I was thinking here. So one of the most, most important things in my opinion is do not be generic we need we need to see you i think that each student is unique has a unique pathway so if the reviewer can can really see you i think you have you, you have more chances so this this like mentorship and and, and the, the the mentoring and 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 student uh, uh the way that they, they they will develop the project needs to be unique so the, the way that the, the ladders are reading needs to be unique so if you put a lot of generic a lot of generic stuff, you know, the things that ever you can read in, 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 at, in any blogs and stuff like that. I think you have, uh, you have less priority for funding, but if you are unique, if you can see that this is a unique applicant, uh, it has much more chances, I think. Great. What about you, Joe? You are also a reviewer, just like all in the call. And what do you look as when you're looking at a mentor statement or an applicant? What are you looking at as a reviewer for the full application? Well, for the uh, to to follow up on what both uh, Deanna and Eduardo said, I want to see that the mentor statement and the applicant statement actually make sense, and you can tell that each other are working together. The last thing I'd like to see or or be enthusiastic about is a mentor who's writing one thing and the applicant is completely disjointed. That clearly tells me this is not a good partnership and the project is likely to fail. You're working together. This is, again, going back to team science and collaboration, especially from a mentor's perspective. And now, uh, following up on Eduardo, what I want to see about the applicant is, and, and I said this before a little bit more dramatically, you want that personal statement to scream about your personality. I'm looking at 10 of these grants, if not more, or letters of intent, and they're all going to read the same generic phrases. I'm passionate about all, well, we're all passionate about Alzheimer's disease. Come on. What makes you stand out? Why should you get this funding and advance the field of Alzheimer's disease research? How are we going to impact the patient? How are we going to better learn about the brain? That's what I love to see. And that, I think, as reviewers, makes us really excited about the grant and say, I want to get to the next page. I can't wait. Yeah. The, I think that's great. I think what the three of you just pointed out, it's fantastic. Uh, from the Alzheimer's Association perspective, that's what we want. And from what I said in the beginning, this if you follow this, you're making the reviewer's life easier. Because I do want to reiterate what Joe said. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is going to send maybe to a reviewer 10 letters of intent to review, maybe 15. And what what point, what is out there? Like what what stands out on your end? your letter of intent or a full application, when you're invited for a full application, we will, the reviewer is not only going to have one full application to review, it's going to have five, maybe 10. And what stands out? What's going to be like, I'm looking at this application and I love this. Everything matches, everything's good. And then moving to the work plan, because this is like, it's, it's kind of a mosaic, right? You're putting pieces together. So you have the mentorship component, you have the applicant component, the letter of support, but then you also have the science. you got to plan the work plan, your hypothesis, your specific aims. So obviously we touched bases a little bit a few minutes ago, but this is you writing more. You have more pages to explore this. 
So how do you write it and do you share it with your mentor or your collaborators as you are writing or once it's done, you have the first draft? And I'll start with Deanna. D did you write your FOIA application and then shared the whole thing with your mentor or your colleagues? Or did you write a little bit, shared, got a little bit of feedback, went back and forth? How was your um, process there? Yeah, I would definitely say the process is irritative. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, as my mentor said to me a long time ago, good writing is rewriting. So um, kind of, you know, stay calm and write. Uh, so I, I uh, found that this is a helpful and kind of an efficient way. So I would actually write, say, um, maybe the mentoring plan. And then I would send that off to my mentoring team. And while they were reviewing that and giving me feedback, then I would start developing sort of my research approach and strategy. So it was um, a, a way to like keep my mind constantly working on the whole application, but really in pieces. And I found that that was very effective. Like say, you know, they're all very busy. So I, they needed say a week or maybe even two, right? To review a document and get it back to me, maybe not, but um, that would give me then say a week or two to then develop the next piece. So by the time I got their feedback, I could then give them the next document. So if you can kind of set it up again, that's why um, going back to the very first question of planning ahead and giving yourself time, you want to be able to build in time for your mentors to actually give you meaningful feedback. And no one likes to get something and saying, hey, can you get this back to me in two days? Um, that's a difference than when they say, oh, I have two weeks or a whole week to give you kind of some feedback. Um, and then they're able to take their time and give you feedback that's potentially going to strengthen the application and um, get you funded. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Eduardo, anything to add? Yes. Usually what I do when, when I have uh, the first draft of a document, I share with one of my colleagues. This is usually, usually what I do. And you need to find these people. So I have four or five colleagues that they are always available for reviewing my grants and my letters of intent. So you need to find this group, the supporting group. And I usually first write the first draft of the document, then I share with, with this group of supporters. Of course, my students, they, they always revise the, the grants as well. They always revise the letter of intent. But I have a group of senior mentors and colleagues that they, uh, they are always available to revise my, my, my grants and my applications. So you need to find these people, this, this supporting group. And usually share when you have the first, in my opinion, it's better to have, you know, the first draft, not to share like one or two paragraphs. So doesn't not, doesn't make sense in my opinion. You know, you need to have like at least a full document, then they can revise and give you a feedback. What about you, Joe? No, I agree with what both the Lord and Deanna have mentioned. Give folks enough time to review it. No, it's okay. Make sure it's, it's not, it, it's, it's written, maybe rewritten a little bit, because I, I love what Deanna said, good writing is rewriting. And, and make sure that, because it's respectful, you want to be respectful to the folks who are helping you. And so that's, uh, I, I, I completely agree with what you said. Give enough time and write something that's compelling and, and coherent, and then you're going to get feedback, things that, you know, that I haven't seen. And now I can adjust for that. Yeah, I think. Uh... Can I, can I? <laughs> Yeah, of course. This is a Re conversation. Yeah, yeah. We write several times before sharing. <laughs> Do not share like your first draft. We write several times. This is the best advice that one can give, you know? People want to receive something sharp to revise. Super important, Joel. I think this is super, super important. The best advice ever when you are sharing a document. I think rewrite, and I think I like what Deanna said is also keep calm and write. So then that could be a mug for, to distribute around the field, keep, keep calm and, or maybe a t-shirt. But it is, it is uh, I think uh, from the Alzheimer's Association perspective, this is what we want. We want people to think ahead, plan ahead. We have cycles opening and reopening throughout the year. And the network, it's something important. Like Eduardo said, have those mentors, have those people that you can share your application. And the Alzheimer's Association, like I mentioned, you have iStart, maybe you will have a network there, you have network within your university uh, or friends and family. And I actually, uh, from the webinar series that we had, 
about the guide to the grants, someone actually mentioned that if that shares their application to, I think, was a spouse or someone in the family that's not a medical field, or but if they could understand it, the the message not through the science but the message that was being dropped, they were like, okay, I'm writing concisely, I'm writing, it's understandable. So those are all tips that I think it's useful for you listening that when you put an application in, I think that's what we're looking for. And then the last stage, but not the most, uh, obviously, I think the most important of all, it's like the budget. Uh, you need, so you put the science on the paper, how much do you need? How do you uh, supplies, maybe salary, maybe a collaborator, uh, maybe an uh, equipment or a core, they, how do you put the budget together? How do you think about this within the funding um, that you have available for the specific project that you're applying. So Deanna, did you think, did you work with your mentor? Did you work with the institution department? Um, and then you also have to put the uh, budget justification. So it's not only putting numbers on a spreadsheet, but also explaining why you need that. So how, how did you work with that? Yeah, so I definitely worked more with my, um my department, we have a person who helps with grants. And so um, I put together a, you know, sort of like an Excel spreadsheet of the categories that I was thinking about. So um, for travel, for example, for salary. Um, so I really just kind of thought about, you know, and think about using those dollars. And of course, over the, um, the length of the award. So, um, you know, in my case, my award is for three years. So um, looking at for example, what conferences, especially the Alzheimer's conference, um, the annual conference that's every year. So making sure I allotted that for travel to attend that. Um, and then of course, thinking about my salary support and any other research dollars that I needed to really support the work. Um, and then I, I, I also, when I wrote up the budget justification, though I will say one caveat. So I worked closely with the my department when I was actually putting together um, you know, the Excel spreadsheet, just like, what am I thinking about for the, the three years that I'm going to have this, this grant. But then when it came to my budget justification, um, I definitely worked with my mentors. So I really want that to be clear because, um, you know, the, the grant person, although they're really familiar with, you know, putting together these budgets, they've done them before for other grants. Um, it's really important that I think that your mentor just read over the budget justification, just so you have another set of eyes to make sure that it's clear what you're going to be using the money for and that you're justifying it appropriately. Great. Thank you, Deanna. What about you, Eduardo? I know like Deanna is located in the United States, just like as Joe, but you are located in a different country and maybe some of the viewer, uh, the listeners are also in other countries uh, and you're in Brazil. Is it different? What do you do, you do differently? Yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's a little bit different, but, but I think that the mo most important thing is the budget needs to make sense needs to match with the experiments that you are proposing. This is the first thing. If you are proposing something, the budget needs to match. This is, the, the I think, my tip number one. Uh, in Brazil, of course, like, the, this, the, for example, if you want to pay a salary for a postdoc, for a PhD student, it's much cheaper. So we can have multiple postdocs in the same application because uh, uh, the, the, our currency here, the real, uh, it's much less than the, the US dollars. So this is something that is different. But let, let, let me tell you a history that what happened with me, my first application for Alzheimer's Association. I was checking my applications uh, a few days ago and I reread the comments from, from the reviewers from uh, my first application that was not funded by the Alzheimer's Association. And I, 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 I received a lot of good, uh, uh, good reviews, good revisions like reviewer number one was very happy with the proposal. So the, the question was good, everything was good. And one of the reviewers, he, he gave me a, a, a poor uh, uh, rate for, for my, my budget. And then I realized that at the time I have a deal with an institution here to pay only 10% for a positron emission tomograph imaging uh, scans. So it was a very small amount and, and I didn't justify. So he wrote back, okay, this is, this is unrealistic. It's too cheap for a PET scan. 
and I realized I should have expand the explanation to show him that I have this deal. In fact, is one uh, one of the advantages advantage of the of my proposal. You know, I would be able to to run multiple pet scans with a very small amount of money, and you know, it become one of the weaknesses of my my proposal, and I, I didn't get the grant. So what I think it's important to match, and if you have something that is different, something that is good for you, you need to expand and explain why you are paying so little for something or why you are, uh, for example, uh, in my last application, I have two or three postdoctoral uh, uh, scholarships that I will be able to pay because the salary in Brazil is much lower than the salary in the US. This is, this is kind of an advantage that you need to make clear in the budget justification. Thank you, Eduardo. That's a good for the ones listening that are in different countries that are not in the U.S. And even if you are in the U.S., right, Joe, like Deanna said, uh, you do need to justify, you need to explain if you're asking 10% here or you're not having a salary, you're not asking salary because maybe it's coming from another funding mechanism. Uh, you need to explain that. So, Joe, how do you put your budget together? Well, I'll just say two things. First, to follow up on, on Eduardo's comments, the, the review groups uh, are made up of folks from different parts of the world as well, but the majority is going to be from the United States and a few folks from, from Europe. And in fact, I remember, and, and it's an anecdote I want to share, <clears throat> that something similar came up in our last group where an application from Brazil was going to look at a recruitment of patients. And one of the reviewers thought, well, this doesn't make sense in terms of the budget. How are they going to recruit patients and this number of patients? And we said, well, wait a minute. We don't know how it works in Brazil. Uh, and they may have a close uh, relationship with a hospital that is already invested in doing some of this research. And so it led to an interesting discussion that normally we wouldn't have had. So while the reviewers are trying to be open, it's not natural for folks who work in the United States to understand the policies and the costs in other, in other places. And that's why it's so important to come back in your budget justification and say, we are only going to pay 10% for uh, PET scans because we have this subsidy or, or, or whatnot. And then it becomes, as Eduardo said, uh, a huge strength. The second thing I want to mention is that most people that I know, uh, most people who I know dislike doing the budget because it's a lot of grunt work. But I'll tell you something. It's... I dislike it as well. But first of all, I work with an amazing team of uh, grant administrators in my department. And with them, I've crafted a spreadsheet, like Deanna said, that has helped me really um, polish the grants in a nice way. For example, I'll come in thinking, okay, this is the total budget. What can I do with this amount of money? And then I go back to my, for example, if I'm doing a mouse study and I have my power analysis, I know I need to do I need 20 mice per group for this particular experiment. And then I come back and I run the budget like, well, that's going to use up the entire budget. So maybe I can't do all of these experiments. And so maybe I can refine and do, well, maybe I can do MRIs. Uh, and then I say, okay, well, the MRI is going to be way too expensive, but do I need all of these analyses and so on and so forth. And that also helps with the timeline. So the budget can inform the grant as much as a grant can help build a budget. And that's what I think uh, Deanna said. It's an iterative process of feeding back and forth. It's all a single unit. And as you can see, the reviewers are going to go through everything. And it's one body uh, coming together as a grant that is not disjointed. It's all connected. I think that some, uh, we're at the end of our uh, conversation today. And I think the things that can come out of this, the take home messages for the ones listening is plan, plan, and plan. Write clearly, share your application, your letter of intent, uh, think about everything, if everything is making sense, like if your letter of intent is making sense, if you're invited for a full application, if everything is making sense. Uh, so before uh, I'll, I'll say the final words, Deanna, do you have any take home messages, the word besides write, uh, rewriting <laughs> and keep calm and write, I like that. Uh, anything else that you want to add, and Eduardo and Joe, your take-home uh, messages? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end with something that my mentor said to me, and I really liked it. And he said, 
hey, you know, you're never going to score a point if you don't um, get off the bench. So I would say that, um, you know, any great idea um, is worthy to be funded, but um, it has to be submitted. So besides keeping calm and writing, um, submit it and see what happens. You might be surprised um, from the outcome. Thank you. Eduardo. Yeah, I would say that, you know, you need time to think. You need to read, 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 write, rewrite, and share with your colleagues. So as Malu Tenzi said, science is a team sport. Share with your colleagues. Great. Joe? I'll, I'll share with you that I love writing grants. I think it's a lot of fun. And that statement has not made me very popular. But the idea here is that um, it's it's an opportunity to write something that's an idea. And you're basing it on a hypothesis, a very well-informed hypothesis. And anything is possible. Even if you're wrong, that's fine. But you're taking an opportunity to just, I mean, it, I know it's corny, but it's really taking a dream and putting it on there. And if you're right, then that would be an amazing uh, contribution to the field. So I, 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 I think we should all enjoy the process of writing grants. Although it's hard sometimes to see the process of the score, but let's write the grants first and then we'll see, worry about the score. Exactly. And if you want, you can, from those, uh, you will get the reviewers like someone mentioned in the beginning and you can make your next application stronger or another mechanism. So uh, it's always tough to get maybe not funded, but it's always a learning experience for sure. And I do want to say something that I always say when I'm talking about grants. We all want to win the lottery. But we gotta pay them. Buy a ticket and put the numbers out there. You only get funded by the Alzheimer Association if you put a letter of intent there. So uh, I wanna that's my take home message. Don't give up. If you don't get funded the first round, come back, resubmit, and don't 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 feel don't don't feel depressed. It's a learning, it's a learning curve for all of us. Um, I want to thank you so much, uh, Deanna, Eduardo, and Joe. This was wonderful. I hope the ones listening also had a great time. And if you are interested in applying for uh, mechanisms of funding for research fellowships or research grants from the Alzheimer's Association, then the next round is going to open in August, September. We currently close for the letter of intent in February and they're under review right now. So the next round will be August and September. So think about that, listen to us. This was great, so many great tips. You will make the proposal strong, the reviewer's job easier. Uh, and hopefully if you have any questions, you always can reach out to the Alzheimer's Association. We do have profiles of all the panelists today on the website, including details of their Twitter accounts. So take a look at the podcast website We'll also include links to all the websites we discussed, so like iStart that I mentioned, and uh, the webinar series that we mentioned that all these three panelists also participated in January, February, and all the show notes. Also, I do want to remember to you all a reminder that to whenever you are, whichever place you are subscribe, uh, you are listening to this, do subscribe to the podcast, spread the word. This is a great resource for dementia, and there's so many great topics uh, out there to be discussed and still being discussed. So thank you again, Joe, Eduardo, and Diana, and uh, listeners for making this a priority, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.